to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. The Apostle Paul, who was formerly known as Saul, asked this great question. Lord, what would you have me to do? Today, we're going to let the Bible answer that question. We hope that you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we look together in our study of the book of Acts. Welcome to the Gospel of Christ program. My name is Ben Bailey, and we're so glad that you've joined us for our broadcast today. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members of the Church of Christ worldwide. Those members of the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their worship assembly. If you've got a Bible question or there's something you'd like to study, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God together with you. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. You can log on to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, and all our Bible study material is free of charge and available to you. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, whether on DVD or CD, we'd love to send that to you. You can fill out a media request form from our website, or you can call us toll-free at 1-855-855. 458 3905. On our website, we have a host of Bible study material, including transcripts, study question, question and answers, and a variety of study materials that would help you in your study of the Word of God. Friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we're concerned about the salvation of souls. That's our main emphasis. We're not concerned about your wallet. We're not concerned about hidden agendas. We just simply want to help men and women know the Word of God and to go to heaven. And so as we transition to our study today, we hope that you'll get your Bible out and have it handy as we're going to look to the Word of God together. In Acts chapter 9, we now come to one of the pivotal conversions in the New Testament. Saul of Tarsus, who has done much harm to the church. He was there when they held the, he held the coats of those who stoned Stephen. Acts chapter 8, he's wreaking havoc on the church, dragging men and women to prison. He's doing everything possible because according to his conscience, he believes Christianity is a farce. But now in Acts chapter 9, Saul is going to come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ as Jesus speaks to him and he now has to come to that truth. Yes, Christianity is true and Jesus is the Son of God. How do those things happen? What takes place? Notice these principles that we learn from Acts chapter 9. First, in Acts chapter 9, Verses 1 and 2, Saul is still breathing threats and murders against the church. He now has in his hand letters from the high priest that if he finds anyone who's of the way, any Christians, he can take them and imprison them. And so with those letters, he's headed down the road. And along that road, Saul is confronted by the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Jesus speaks to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul responds, Who are you, Lord? He realizes whoever this is, is the Lord and Master. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. What a powerful impact. That that light shines around him. He's blinded because of that. Lord, who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. Stop kicking against the goats. You know that idea once he hears who it is and once he realizes he's been doing things that he knows probably aren't right kicking against the goads that which was pressuring that was that was forcing him in that direction he was refusing that and so paul who we now know by the beloved name paul is confronted with christ on the road to damascus and then we hear the type of attitude that made saul such a wonderful servant of god i'm jesus whom you're persecuting It's hard for you to kick against the goads. How did Paul respond? 
to that drastic message that is going to shape his life in a whole new direction. Lord, what would you have me to do? Look at the immediate change that Saul of Tarsus is ready to make. He's been taking Christians who follow Jesus and imprisoning them. Some of them may be being murdered, wreaking havoc on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, holding the coats of those who stoned Stephen. And now Jesus speaks, the miraculous voice of Christ appears to Saul of Tarsus immediately. He's ready to change. You know, friends, that tells us a lot about the heart of Saul of Tarsus. The Bible says in Acts 23, verse 1, Saul said, I've lived in all good conscience until this day. When Paul or when Saul was persecuting Christians, he really believed it was the right thing. When he heard the voice of Jesus, there was no getting around that truth. And he was ready to immediately change his words and so he's blinded on the journey the lord tells him i want you to go in the city it'll be told you what you must do in verses 10 through 19 ananias is now commissioned to go to saul and to preach the gospel unto him and he comes to saul and when we think about saul who's in sin who needs to obey the gospel who needs to submit to jesus what did saul of tarsus do to be saved. You remember that great question? Acts 9 verse 6, Lord, what would you have me to do? Isn't that what everybody, every person ought to be asking? Well, let's get the Bible answer to that question. Saul recounts his own conversion in Acts chapter 22, and I want you to notice what is said in Acts 22 verse 16. The scripture records, Ananias speaking to Saul now, and now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. What did Saul of Tarsus have to do to be saved? He had to hear the voice of Christ. Every person who's going to be saved has to hear the message. He had to believe Jesus was Lord and Christ. Jesus said, unless you believe. You'll all likewise perish. Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. John 8, verse 24. He had to acknowledge that with his mouth. Confess Christ as Lord. Romans 10, verse 10. He had to repent. And no doubt the change, you can look at Saul's life and a complete change was made. But friend, listen carefully. Saul, just like every other conversion in the New Testament, had to be baptized to be saved. What is it? I want you to think real carefully about this with me now. What is it that separates man from God? Well, friend, the clear answer is sin. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, The Lord's ear is not heavy, that He cannot hear. His arms not shortened, that He cannot save. But your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God. Now, if we realize the truth that sin separates us from God, we can also know the exact moment in time when a man is saved. Wouldn't you agree that if sin separates us from God, whenever sin is removed is exactly when man is saved? When does that occur? Listen to Acts twenty two sixteen again. Why are you waiting, Ananias says? Arise, get up, and be baptized. Now watch this. And wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Sins are washed away when a man contacts or a person contacts the blood of Jesus in baptism. Romans 6, verses 1 through 4. One cannot get around the idea that Saul's sins were washed away when he was baptized. Are we saying there's something magical or mystical in the water? That's not the idea. It's the answer of a good conscience toward God. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. It's doing what God said to be saved. Mark 16, verse 16. Just like in Acts 2, 38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Sins are remitted when one obeys the gospel, culminating in the importance of baptism. Now, let's look at another point that can be very vividly seen from the conversion of Saul. What about the sinner's prayer? I hear a lot about the sinner's prayer. Uh, 
people go around the country and around the world today, and a lot of, a lot of teachers have done this, and they'll say, false teachers have said, to be saved, you need to say the sinner's prayer. It usually goes something like this. Lord Jesus, I recognize you as Savior. I ask you to come into my heart and now save me. Did Saul of Tarsus know about the sinner's prayer? Is there ever an example of a sinner praying and he still had to do something to be saved? Friend, if there was ever an example, it's found in Acts chapter 9 with Saul of Tarsus. Notice these words in Acts chapter 9 verse 11. So the Lord said to him, that's to Ananias, Arise, go to the street called Straight, inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Now watch this. For behold, he is praying, blinded by Jesus' light. Here's the message. Wants to know what to do to be saved. Told to go to the, uh, the, the certain house and, and stay there. He's there praying, and yet Ananias still has to come to him and tell him what to do to have his sins washed away. Friend, listen carefully. A lot of people have been lied to and duped into thinking the sinner's prayer is in the Bible. You can look in your Bible from Genesis 1.1 to the very last verse in Revelation 22, 21, and you will never find the sinner's prayer as so many people preach today recorded. There's no doubt you find people praying. There's no doubt Saul was praying. But he still had to do something to be saved. And so when we think about the sinner's prayer, you don't find that in the Scripture. I was preaching in a gospel meeting one time, and I remember it so vividly. I had taught from the Scripture that you don't find the sinner's prayer recorded anywhere in the Bible, and the sinner's prayer, it cannot save. And so after the lesson was over and service concluded, I remember there was a lady who was a visitor that night who made a beeline to me to ask me a question. So she's making a beeline to me, and she comes up, and she says, Preacher, she said, I heard what you said about the sinner's prayer. She said, I'm going to go home. I heard you said about the sinner's prayer not being in the Bible. She said these words. She said, I'm going to go home and ask my pastor. I said, well... That's good. I hope you do. Uh, when you ask him, if he tells you, bring back those verses and we'll look at them together tomorrow night. So she next tomorrow night, we open the service. She comes right in the door and makes a beeline for me again. And so I thought, well, I wonder how this is going to go. And so she comes up to me and she says, Preacher, she said, I went home and I asked my pastor if the sinner's prayer was in the Bible and he told me it wasn't. And then she said these words. And I told him he was a liar. Now, friend, I want you to think about that. That man had been teaching. People who be saved had to say the sinner's prayer. No telling how many people he told that. One of the people who had been listening to him just asked him about it and said, I want you to show me in the Bible where the sinner's prayer is. And he says, um, well, it's not there. And she said, you've been lying to people. How many people have been doing that throughout the world? You cannot find the sinner's prayer in the Bible. There's nowhere that says that the sinner's prayer saves. Saul was praying probably for a, two or three days as we read the context, and he still had to do what Ananias told him to be saved. And so we want to drive that point home because so many have been told that's what you've got to do to be saved. Now, as we turn our attention to Acts chapter 10 and 11, we're going to come to another very unique example of conversion. There is a very good man who, who is desperately trying to live right, but he needs to hear about Jesus and the gospel. And that man's name is Cornelius. You remember Cornelius? The Bible records in Acts chapter 10, verse number 2, that Cornelius was a devout man, one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people, and prayed to God always. He's a good man. He's trying to do right. He's trying to help others. And yet, friend, I want you to listen real carefully. Good, moral people still have to obey the gospel to be saved. I had a neighbor one time who I tried to talk to about the gospel, and we were across the backyard fence, and so I told him, I'd, you know, we'd like for him to come to church, and like to study the Bible with him sometime, and his response was, I'm as good as those people down there at your church. Well, I don't have a church to begin with, but nonetheless, his idea was, I'm a good moral person, and that's going to save me. Friend Cornelius was a spectacular moral person probably. He prayed, he helped the poor, he was devout, sincere, and he was trying to do the things to please God. Good morally, 
good man. But good moral people will still be lost if they don't obey the gospel. Friend, it doesn't matter how much you do benevolently. doesn't how much you do in helping the poor. doesn't not matter how much you do that is believed to be moral and upright. If, if people who are good moral people don't obey the gospel, they'll still be lost on the day of judgment. And so Peter it sees a vision. He is told to go to Cornelius. Cornelius also receives a vision and he's told that there's a man coming to him. And so Cornelius is at his house. Peter comes to him and he begins to preach the gospel unto him. And so what you've got here is, a, and this is an amazing scene. In Acts chapter 10, the door is now open for the gospel to be preached to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 2, the Jews heard it. First time, Acts chapter 10, the, the gospel is now going to the Gentiles. Just as God promised, the wall would be broken down and all men, the two would become one in Christ. Ephesians 2 verse verses 14 through 16. And so Peter comes to preach the gospel to Cornelius. Cornelius is so overwhelmed and overjoyed about this Jewish servant of God coming to him a Gentile to preach the gospel that he tries to do something that isn't right. And Peter recognizes that. I want you to look in Acts chapter 10, verse number 26 at what happens. The Bible records these words for us. As Peter, verse number 25, as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. Now, friend, I want you to stop right there for just a moment and think about this. Did Peter, what did Peter do when this man fell down and worshipped him? Did Peter say, glad you're doing that, that's probably what you ought to be doing. Did Peter say, uh, here's my ring, you want to kiss it also? Like my funny hat, doesn't it look good? Is that what Peter said? No. Peter didn't say that. What did Peter say? Acts chapter 10, verse number 26. Look at these words. Peter said, Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up. I myself am also a man. You know, a lot of people want to venerate, want to hold up Peter and want to say Peter was uh, better than others and that Peter was the first pope and that he is worthy of worship and praise. But if that's true, Peter didn't know it and the Holy Spirit sure didn't record it in the Bible. Um, a Gentile comes in and he decides, I'm going to worship this man because he must be a great servant of God. And Peter says, uh-uh, you get up. I'm a man just like you. All men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. There is no clergy laity. There is no big me and little you. The idea of people worshiping other people or worshiping saints or falling down before Peter or Mary or the Pope today. Friend, that's not in the Bible, and the Bible teaches that's not acceptable before Almighty God. And so, as Peter begins to preach to Cornelius, he preaches that God's not prejudiced. He's no respecter of persons, but every nation that worketh righteousness and obeys His will can be received by Him. Whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, that doesn't matter to God. God's not concerned with ethnicity. God's not concerned with race. God's not concerned with how much money I've got or how uh, smart I or um, any of that. How many degrees I've got? God is no respecter of person, persons. Every nation that worketh right and obeys the gospel can be saved. And so, what is it that Peter commanded Cornelius and those who heard the message to do? Look at Acts chapter ten, and I want you to notice verse number forty-eight. The Bible says, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, and they asked him to stay a few days. Every account of conversion, people hear the message. They believe in Jesus. They recognize He is the Lord and the Savior. They're willing to change whatever they need to change, acknowledge Jesus as Son of God, and he commanded them to be baptized. Here's another reason for baptism. Do we realize baptism is a command of God? Can one overlook a command of God and be saved? Well, of course not. Jesus said, Matthew 7, verse 21, Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. 
Now, friend, another important principle, and we learn this from Peter's recounting. This is what Acts chapter 11 is about. Peter now is going to go back to the Jews and recount the fact that God has opened the door of salvation to the Gentiles. And I want you to notice something very important he says in Acts 11 verse 14. The Scripture records these words. Simon said, her surname is Peter, said, who would tell you words by which you and all your household will be saved. Friend, to be saved, a person has to hear the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's Word. The Word is where the emphasis is. Hearing the message, the all-powerful Word of God, the Gospel, that's God's power unto salvation. Now, let's think about this idea. These people in Acts chapter 11 and the people following that who obey the Gospel, when they obeyed the gospel, when they submitted to the will of God, when they were added to the Lord's church, what were they called? What did they go by? Look at Acts chapter 11. Let's see what first century followers of Christ were called. Acts 11 verse 26, the Bible records for us these marvelous words. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so it was that for a whole year... They assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And listen to this. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Disciples, believers, Christians, uh, those who follow Christ. Those are biblical designations of followers of the Lord in the first century. Now, friend, we don't find denominational names. We don't find somebody called a, a follower of John Wesley, a Methodist. We don't find a Baptist. We don't find Episcopal. We don't find Catholic. We don't find Presbyterian. Those names and those man-made denominational designations that cause mass division are not found in the Bible. Friend, may I ask you this? If being called simply a Christian was good enough for Christians in the first century, for followers of Christ in the first century, shouldn't it be good enough for us? Shouldn't we be what they were? Put away all the ideas and, and the names and the division of men and the sectarianism. Hey, let's just be Christians. Let's just be members of the Lord's church. Let's just do what they did in the first century to be saved. If we do what they did, if we're called by what they were called in the Bible, you can't go wrong. Let's follow that pattern which God gave us so that we could follow and live according to the teaching of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, in Acts chapter 12, things take a rather dark turn. Peter is imprisoned. And now we have a, a John who's going to be imprisoned as well. And we have now an evil, ungodly ruler who is trying to snuff out Christianity. And watch what happens in Acts chapter 12, verse 22 and 23. The Bible records these words. And the people, talking about Herod, and the people kept shouting to Herod, the voice of a God and not a man. Then immediately... An angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and died. One is beheaded here. Peter's been put in prison. It looks like the church is facing great persecution and the evil government is having its way with the church. Is that what's going to happen? Is God going to intervene? Is the Lord going to protect His people and His church? Herod gives this, what they think is a great speech. They're just trying to butter him up for political reasons. And they say, that was the voice of a God, not a man. He didn't give glory to God. Angel of the Lord struck him. He was eaten by worms and died right there. Now, what about Christianity? What, Herod, we know what happened to him. Is the church going to be snuffed out by the evil government of that day? Notice in your Bible what the Word of God says in Acts chapter 12, verse number 24. The Scripture says upon the death of the evil ruler Herod, but the Word of God grew 
and multiplied. Yes, there was evil governments in that day. Yes, there were evil people. Bad things even happened to Peter. Bad things happened to John. People died in this chapter. There were martyrs for Christ. But you know what didn't get snuffed out? The power of the gospel, the word of God, and the evil governments of those days did not win and were not victorious over Christianity. Friend, God's going to take care of His people. We can cast all our cares upon Him because He cares for us. God's going to deal with evil governments and evil rulers. God still rules in the kingdoms of men. Daniel 4, verse 25 and 26 teaches. And so the principle we learn here is let's continue to trust in God. Let's continue to trust in the power of of God's Word, the Gospel, and it is the Word of God that will grow and multiply and God will give the increase. And so, back to the overall mission. Acts chapter 1. You shall be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, Jerusalem, to the uttermost parts of the world. God wants us to go out and preach the Gospel. God's going to take care of the things that happen. God's going to take care of evil people that might get in the way of that. And God is going to right the wrongs ultimately on the day of judgment. When Christians hear these wonderful words, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. And so what we've seen in these chapters are marvelous examples of the power of the gospel. Think about this. Christianity's greatest, single greatest enemy does a 180 degree turn, obeys the gospel, and now becomes the greatest working evangelist that we read of, one of the greatest working evangelists we read of in the New Testament. The door is open for the Gentiles, and thank God that it is, for that includes many of us, if not all today, and the gospel truly is for all. Friend, we ask you today the very simple question that the book of Acts begs. Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Have you heard the message of Christ? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. They had to hear words whereby they could be saved, Acts eleven fourteen. Have you believed Jesus is the Son of God, John 8, verse 24? Are you willing to repent and change your ways, Acts 3, verse 19? Would you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, Acts 8, verse 36 through 38? And would you do what Saul did to be saved? We ask you this, just like Saul asked Ananias, here's the question we leave you with today. If you've not done these things, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We pray that you'll continue with us in our study of the book of Acts as we look at these marvelous lessons together. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.